Welcome to the One Minute Preceptor Podcast, your resource for clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships in healthcare. Learn how to earn letters of recommendation, prepare for your clerkship, and excel at patient care from preceptors with years of practice. We interview physician educators in every specialty and clinical setting to discuss how to prepare for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Here's your host and MedEd entrepreneur, Chase DeMarco. In this episode, we are joined by Dr. James Gomez, who is a board-certified OBGYN in the greater Chicago area. Dr. Gomez has participated as a clinical preceptor for 10 years and has trained dozens of budding young physicians. Dr. Gomez, so great to have you on the show. Thanks, Chase. Great to be here. What do you see as your role as an educator in your chosen profession? For medical students, ob is part of the core, although it's kind of a specialty, not necessarily a, a complete primary care. Fortunately, it's not everybody's going to be getting that experience after they're done and delivering babies or doing gyne surgeries. But there's a lot of the primary care that we do get involved with and take care of. And I think it's a good base for medical students to have moving forward in their careers. It is an interesting mix with primary care and surgery and a lot wrapped into one. Right. In what setting do you generally teach? University, community setting? So I have a solo private practice. I'm, I'm not working with a group or nurse practitioner. So uh, it's a community hospital I work out of. So from my office to the hospital, and it's a community. So it's not like there's not residents around. It's just the nurses and, and how much uh, students are, are able to get involved but it's from the office and and the uh, hospital. So that offers a great mixture for students to gain education and experience in. Right, exactly. And how many students do you generally teach? Well, it varies. It's between one, two, sometimes three students at a time, four to six week rotations. Some some of them are fourth year students doing electives. Some of them are third year students or first rotation and they haven't had any surgical or really hands-on patient experience. My office happens to be kind of small, so I don't like to take too many people at the same time and then it just kind of dilutes it and then nobody learns anything. So it's uh, kind of try to keep small groups. And what type of students do you generally take? Only MD and DO or are there also opportunities for PAs shadowing nurse practitioners? I've had PAs. I've had uh, nurse practitioners. So who has, it depends on the schedule and who's available and uh, what the requirements are too. It's like nurse practitioners don't really do anything in a the hospital. They'll just do outpatient stuff. But most of them are medical students. Great diversity, it sounds like. Yeah. What do you feel makes a good or great preceptor in your specialty? Well, I mean, it's kind of like a, a greater good doc. First of all, you got to care. You got to care about the person you're you're uh, you're trying to teach. You know, if you you uh, have a somewhat of a vested interest, and that goes, it's a two way street on that too. So if the student comes in and doesn't really care, then it's not interested. Then it makes it tougher to teach that person. But a good preceptor is going to figure that out, see what the strengths and weaknesses are, and help them kind of nurture them along, move them along to see what they may be good at and what they may be weak in and help them to get a little stronger in that or even and enhance their strengths too. What do you feel are some unsafe practices that preceptors in your specialty might take? Well, I, I guess it's like anything else, it's you, you can be lazy and, and you're not necessarily doing uh, student justice if you, you're not there to watch them and, and I don't necessarily have to hold their hand the whole time, but you have to, I guess, keep them on a short leash, so to speak, and, and not let them go wild and, and run away. So you got to pull them back and show them, hey, this is what you're supposed to be doing. This is how you got to do it and keep a close eye. I mean, I would say we're doing pelvic exams, so I'm not going to let a student go in and do a pelvic exam by him or herself. It's I got to be there with them and even almost put my hands on their hands to do the, the procedure the right way. Proper mentorship. I like it. Yeah. What are some mistakes that you have experienced and learned from or seen others experience in your specialty? Maybe there's sometimes too much of a distance or make me maybe too close of a relationship. In other words, it's too buddy buddy and then there's there's like too strict. You know, you don't have to be strict and hard on, on medical students. So you got here, you've worked your butts off, you're not little children. 
So, you know, to be hard on a, on a medical student isn't necessary. And we're all people. So, you know, to have too close of a relationship can kind of be damaging too. Because then you start to trust somebody to do more than what they're capable of doing. And then it's a high liability business too. And so I have to be extra careful with that as far as things going wrong uh, with, with the care and the care of especially a pregnant patient. It sounds like proper boundaries are a very important aspect of your specialty. Yeah, exactly. For an example of the one-minute preceptor model in your practice, how do you get a student to commit to a diagnosis or treatment plan? I'll send a student in to see the patient, or maybe we'll even go in together to see the patient, and he'll ask or she'll ask questions, I'll ask questions to the patient, and then start guiding the student to narrow things down into what could be the potential diagnosis. What that is then is the, um, you know, before I blurt out what I'm doing, I'll always ask, well, what do you think? What's on your mind? What's your differential? Which way are you going with this? So I'll let them make their decisions before I tell them, all right, this is what we're doing and kind of push them, push them through that. Are there any particular ways that they can provide supporting evidence for their decisions? All right, so I'm a gynecologist. I have an ultrasound in the office, and we're looking at an ultrasound machine, and you know we're looking at the images. So they're seeing the images, and they got to start picking up on, on what certain things are looking like. If it's pregnancy, or if it's uh, pregnancy related, or if it's um, gynecology related, they're right there looking at the screen. So I want them to train their eye as to what they're looking at and to help them use that information to help with the diagnosis too. How can you reinforce when a student has accurately diagnosed or treated a patient? Well, you know, it's the old add a boy, add a girl. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they do a good job or what the hell are you thinking if they're not, you know, get it wrong. But, uh, you know, the old kick in the pants. But it's, but yeah, you, you definitely, if they're on the wrong track, you got to bring them back. It's, it's, you can't let them keep going down the wrong track and, and uh, coming up with the wrong plan. If they're on the right track, then we, then I'll keep them going. But if they're going, they're swaying away, hey, get back over here. You're going, you're not looking at this right. So that answers the next part of it. Step four is how do you guide to errors and omissions made by a student? Right. goes along with it. Stuff has to make sense. And they're going through this process. Uh, rule number one, it makes sense. <laughs> and step five is teaching the general principle. Are there any clinical pearls that can be used in those types of situations? You know, sometimes it's hard to, to get students to see the big picture versus, you know, looking at the specific things. Like, for instance, a patient will have complaints of a UTI, but then, you know, they'll be fixated on, well, the UA was negative and there was no evidence. You know, labs can be wrong. And, and even though a patient is having the symptoms of a UTI, it looks like it, smells like it, but, it, you know, we don't have the proof of it. You got to use big picture and treat the human being and not necessarily treat the, the lab result all the time. I mean, we use labs to guide us, but that doesn't mean that that's an absolute. And your pearl of it has to make sense seems to be a great one as well. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> what do you expect from students when they start a rotation with you? Well, definitely a commitment. If they're going to be working with me, I want them to, to show up on time, right? I want to be a little prepared. I don't do like, I don't have a syllabus. I don't have, you know, some, hey, this is what you got to know. It's, it's, you know, there's plenty of textbooks for that. So it's a case by case. So you kind of have to know a lot when you start with me because then, you know, I'll get a pregnancy case with hypertension and I'll get maybe a pregnancy with diabetes uh, or just a plain old normal pregnancy. Uh, And then I'll have a gynecology patient, the next one with severe menorrhagia. And if you haven't studied any of that stuff, well, you're not going to know anything, and then now it's you're behind already. So you got to be prepared, or and then a lot of it is repetition too. So it's we'll get the same thing the next day and the next day. So if you're not reviewing stuff and keeping up with it, then you know, and then I'm answering the same questions or telling you the same information over and over. That kind of where where's on the uh, preceptor too. So there's a lot of mixed system knowledge when it comes to OB guide. Right. Exactly. Are there any ways that a student might excel in your rotation or any tips for that? You know, depending on where some students live kind of far and don't have transportation, so it makes it difficult for them to be there at two in the morning for a delivery or sit in labor with a patient who may not deliver for 24 hours. You never know. Uh, So that kind of uh, time commitment is tough, but necessary. So the more you you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. The more you're going to see, the more uh, experience you're going to get. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's the individual, really. 
If a student is looking for a letter of recommendation from you, what are some tips they can use to guide them? Well, I mean, you know, I expect you to work work hard and uh, and ask. <laughs> All you have to do is ask. So, uh, but you know, you got to have an interest and work hard at it. You know, somebody who's who hardly shows up and doesn't have much of an interest. Well, you know, what am I going to say? How am I going to write a letter for you? Good point. Good point. Are there any particular mistakes that you've seen past students make? I think that's a good point, Chase. One of the things is sterile technique. You know, a lot of people forget that. You know, you'll you'll touch something that's contaminated, and then you'll touch something that's not contaminated. So that I think uh, almost every student of mine has has done that. They forget. You know, you touch this, and now you're touching other things. And you're like, hey, get, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Go through a lot of gloves, then. <laughs> right. <laughs> Are there any resources that you would recommend for students before they start your rotation? You know, I, I don't. Um, ACOG is American College of OB-GYN. has a lot of stuff, but I don't have any particular textbook that's, uh, you know, that I would say, yeah, this is the best thing that you can look at. I'm not really sure. All right. Are there any parting thoughts for students? Well, good luck. I mean, this is, you're here for a reason and, you know, that's, that's uh, your choice and you've got to work hard at it if you want to be a good doc. And uh, we all make mistakes and it's just learn from it and don't do it again. Any thoughts for physicians looking to start precepting? Patience, man. You got to have patience with these kids. <laughs> <laughs> got to be good to them too. It'll be good to you. <laughs> well, Dr. James Gomez, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Chase, it's been a pleasure. Take care. Good luck to you too. Listeners, I want to thank you for listening to the show, and I hope you are sharing it with your classmates, co-workers, and anyone interested in medicine and education. The show is growing rapidly, and I want to sincerely thank each of you for taking the time to listen. There are many things you could be listening to now or spending your time on, so it means a lot that you find value in this material. If you have any suggested topics, please find Free Med Ed on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or email freemededweb at gmail.com. We actually have so many topics that we would love to cover and would actually be interested in releasing episodes more frequently than just once a week. But to do this, we need help. It takes a lot of time to find and research guests, schedule meetings, record the show, edit the episodes, and then post all of this to the relevant feeds. If you would like to help out, I can train you on networking, audio editing, and social media. This can reflect positively on your CV as well. So if you would like more episodes, or just want to learn new skills, reach out to any of our free med ed accounts.